Hello, I'm Doug, stand-up physicist, and this is another in the video series, Playing with Physics, Research Through Outreach. And the title of this talk is Observing Billiards Using Space-Time Numbers. Now half that title should be understandable, because we know billiards, right? And we're literally going to be analyzing this particular shot eight, eight ball in the corner pocket. But we're going to be using something called space-time numbers. And that's an invention of my own, so why did I do that? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try and explain that by looking through a collection of books over here. Yeah, here. Okay, so um, we start with a brief history of time because this is what really motivated me to begin my kind of hobby of studying physics uh, back uh, in the late 80s, so quite some time ago. And a lot of people got it and then didn't read it. <laughs> I did read it! Okay, and uh, it tells a story about how our best understanding of gravity, general relativity, Einstein's general relativity, doesn't get along with quantum mechanics. But I wanted more detail than this book provided, so I, I, I made it, I think, again, a part-time job of studying physics. And, oh my goodness, look at this book. This is literally... <laughs> over a thousand pages of really technical stuff, okay? Um, it was, it's a very important book in the history of general relativity because it said, not is, it said you, there's a lot to study about, there's a lot to think about, and it came out in the 70s and really changed the entire field. And if you're going into uh, learning about um, uh, general relativity from a serious kind of technical point of view, uh, basically everybody has this book. Now, that it's not their favorite book. They probably prefer another one. But we know an awful lot about uh, gravitation. And what, one of the things I really like about this book... Oh, my God. <laughs> it's heavy. Now, um, then there's this subject called quantum mechanics that nobody ever seems to... It seems to be still a mystery at some deep level. And yet, um, I spent two years essentially uh, taking uh, uh, classical quantum mechanics and then relativistic quantum mechanics when I worked as uh, a lab tech at Harvard University. And there's really so much to calculate in this biz, uh, business. This is called, uh, th this book is by Cohen and Tanuji. Um, there's just so many, many, many things, m many more things you can calculate using quantum mechanics. But the problem is, even if you learn this level of detail, that you can't bridge these two. Well, there must be a bridge between these two, right? Well, and that bridge must be made out of mathematics. Now, this is oh, EDM. Oh, EDM two. There, there we go. It's the EDM two uh, encyclopedic dictionary of mathematics. Okay, second edition. I don't know if they've got a third, but this is kind of a crazy book because. Well, first of all, again, it's huge, but it's all these the definitions of uh, of math stuff, okay? Uh, and of course, since it's it's math, they they always refer to things um, by numbers. So we've got uh, 379 i on series. <laughs> term wise, differentiation of infinite series with functional function terms. Okay, so um, if there's going to be a bridge between these two, I'm going to say two things. First of all, it's got to be in this book. Or maybe this book. Okay, because this is, these, everything is built out of mathematics and physics. 
But I'm going to say something uh, different, and that is that it's also not in this book. Well, hold it. How can you both be in the book and not be in the book? Well, because you have to do something new and novel with the definitions that are in this book. Or, you know, you're just fooling yourself. So, let's, let's do my hypothesis here. So, we're opening up the good book, EDM 2, Volume 1, going specifically to 29B, okay? And the second paragraph here, okay, so the most frequently used example of a division algebra is the quaternion field H, often called uh, Hamilton's quaternion algebra, after good old W.R. not on Broadway Hamilton, 1858. This is a four-dimensional, I'm emphasizing that part, <laughs> linear space over the real number field R with the basis 1IJK and the following laws of multiplication. And I'll skip over that. All right, now we go to a different section. We go specifically to uh, 151B, okay? And we're going to go down to this paragraph here. The, a group G of order 8. I'm kind of emphasizing that again. <laughs> uh, with two giant generators, sigma, tau, and relations, uh, so all this kind of stuff, called the quaternion group. This group is isomorphic to the multiplicative group consisting of plus and minus 1, plus and minus i, plus and minus j, plus and minus k, in the quaternion field. Okay, so my things that I call space-time numbers have eight parts, like the quaternion group. And that's the, the thing. I think Hamilton understood quaternions, or first approach to quaternions, was a little bit wrong. Um, not a lot wrong. Uh, or it, It's not even wrong. It's, it's certainly useful, but it's not as useful as it could be. So... Let, let me explain what I mean by here, because in some ways it's not that complicated. This is how I tried to explain it to my wife. This, this line up here is, is Hamilton's quaternions. And you got four numbers, and so it goes one, two, minus three, four. This is like the time-like thing, and these three are space. So it's, it's not like it's not understandable or something. And what I think you need to do is actually have four pairs of doublets, so one and zero, two and zero, zero, three, oh, that's how you indicate a negative number, and four and zero. And you might say, well, hold on a second, can't you now have, like, all kinds of different other ways to represent exactly that same quaternion? Like, three, four minus three is one, and four minus two is two, and 17 minus 20 is minus 3, and 35 minus 31 is 4. So should I list all the possibilities? <laughs> Probably not. Um, and you go, that seems like a nightmare, and it's very inconvenient. Um, but the thing is that nature does all kinds of cr crazy stuff with numbers, and so maybe we need these space times numbers, space time numbers, because they are a little crazy. Now, um, I, I I think I'll show you th this little thing that I, I ha hang up um, in my office here, uh, because this is my understanding of number theory, and it's usually not presented this way. But um, the top line there. Um, actually, let me come over here. See if I can see if I can do this. All right. So this top line up here is all about addition. Okay. Then we've got the rules of multiplication here, 
and then then we're thinking about what is it going to look like uh, if we um, go and animate all this stuff. Because I think that's where numbers get really tricky, is when you say they don't last forever, they're uh, transient, and, um, and we have to deal with that transience of the math instead of lasting forever kind of idea. And then each row, that one's, uh, the far one is about 0 and 1. These are the real numbers. These are the complex numbers and the quaternions. Now, I'm going to have a, a show devoted just to this wall hanging at some point in, in this series. Um, but the, the, the obvious thing, the only obvious thing I want to, want to take you away is look at how complicated these things are, okay? These are the space-time numbers, and they look like they're going to be complicated enough to deal with 3D space, right? I mean, look, look at that little star chucker kind of thing. Um, this is the multiplicative group Q8, and you go, wow, that's, uh, that's quite some cube uh, there. And then when you start to think about how you're going to animate that, uh, it all gets crazy. Okay, so because nobody, and I mean nobody, has working experience with space-time numbers, um, I came up with some uh, with an IPython notebook that allows you to actually do calculations with them and see the consequences and see that in fact you can get pretty standard results. Okay, so now we're going to go into the IPython world. Okay, I'm going to try and give you an impression of this IPython notebook I created to actually work with space-time numbers because I think they're so kind of odd. Um, and you can go ahead and with your browser look at this at your leisure or you can actually clone this all of the code here and run it on your computer and instructions are actually provided here too. Okay, so the whole thing was to study this particular shot my friend AJ made, uh, eight ball going into the corner pocket. So how do I get numbers associated with this? Well, the first thing I did was uh, simplify things considerably um, down to just uh, two frames. Um, and now because they're frames, I could say one frame number was this was the first one and another frame was the second one. Now I've got three observers there in the corner. I've got this observer A in yellow and observer B in pink and observer C flying high above the table in pink or purple. I'm not sure what's, what color that is. All right. And uh, because that's the whole thing, I'm going to think about looking at the same thing by ha with different people. All right. Great. So how do I get numbers? Well, one way is to put graph paper here and then say that it's um, two and a half over for A and it's uh, three up. Now B is going to be slightly different, smaller uh, on the X and bigger on the Y, and C is going to be exactly like A, except that uh, its Z is going to be different. Uh, and in the second frame, it's about, I don't know, nine and a half, uh, and it's actually down for observer A. Okay, great. So uh, how do we get real numbers? Well, you use a dial caliper, and since I'm in the United States, that's actually in inches. Hmm, crazy. All right, then uh, I've got to go and work with the numbers that I've collected on a sheet of paper. And so let me give you a sense of that. I use this thing called QToolsDevo, a bit of code that I wrote, and it knows how to take in eight numbers and then add them, subtract them, multiply them, divide them, a uh, bunch of other things. So the numbers that I got out of the dial caliper weren't quite the numbers that uh, appeared on the graph paper, so I had to scale thing, uh, scale it. So I've got this Q type, which which kind of gets a label for things, and uh, and I'm going to mul be multiplying. Um, oh, right here, I'm going to form the product uh, with that thing, and basically it's going to increase it by a factor of two. And so you see, I get two and a half, and I get three point one four five. Oh, almost almost pi. Um, and then uh, for the second frame, it's nine versus, oh, here's how we get a minus. We've got the first a zero and then a point eight. 
Okay, great. So the thing about working in space-time is that you really need to work with differences between events. Because if you think of an event, you keep on getting farther and farther away from it because you keep on getting older and older and older. But if you think about the difference between two events, that's going to be stable in time. So we can see that we have this Q, QX, Q scaled minus Q scaled. Okay, so this is a, what I call a delta quaternion. And then to figure out distances, you square it. And in this form, you see uh, 64 or so for the difference between um, the two squared distance. That's distance. And here's the difference in time. It's a huge number. Okay. Um, and so this is one case where it's nice to not reduce uh, the numbers. Okay, now observers B and C end up with a different collection of numbers. That indicates that they're different observers. <laughs> so the input numbers are never the same. And so we keep trying to find something that's sim uh, similar between the two. And we go, oh, that's right, the squares. The squares are, oh, they're not exactly the same. Why is that? Because I use dial calipers. Uh, I didn't use dial calipers for the time, and uh, the time part is the same in both of them. Okay, it's basically about a one percent different difference. Okay, so what would happen if I just had my graph paper and I just angled it different? Well, that shouldn't change anything, should it? <laughs> and it doesn't. All right. Um, and what if I went to graph paper that was like this? Should that change anything? It's like, well, it'll change the numbers that go in, but not the distances. And here's an important point about what I'm doing versus the standard sort of thing. Most people would look at that who are formally trained and think that I'm doing a coordinate transformation because that's what we all learn about. And coordinate transformations deal with vectors over mathematical fields like real numbers. This is not what I'm doing, okay? I am not using real numbers. That's why I've got these doublets everywhere. What I'm dealing with are representations of numbers, okay? So numbers can have different representations. It changes the value, just not the meaning. That's very different from coordinate transformations where you think about basis vectors and changing your basis vectors. Okay, I'm just changing the background, changing the numbers, but the distances obviously are going to remain the same because nothing physically has changed between those two events, just the background that I measure against. And so I have this function uh, called uh, what is cylindrical to Cartesian, and it is going to convert my degree of 68 to a, a, an x and a y sort of thing along with the, the, the distance, uh, the radius. And uh, you go ahead and do you do it, and you get these uh, numbers right around 64 when you square the distance. All right. Now, how about boosting? Now, that is something that shows up in special relativity, but you don't have to be going super fast. You just have to keep more digits around if you go slower. So um, this guy is clearly closer, and he's not going to be around 9. He's going to be around 7 now. Um, and he's going to get that information a little sooner. So what does that mean? Well, uh, you, it means that you have this relativistic velocity that's uh, pretty small, uh, 10 to the minus 9 sort of number. And um, you go ahead and you calculate everything out, and you end up with your, your typical, um, where's my prototypical number? Um, yeah, there's, there's that 65 number. All right, great. So I also came up with this, this way of, of summarizing what's going on, and, um, and you see this, this time-like uh, time exact. That means the boosted guy versus the unboosted guy still have the, exactly the same interval as they're supposed to have. All right. So now well, let's think a little bit about gravity. Um, and uh, this first expression is Newton's theory of gravity. And then the second expression is um, what is tested in weak field tests 
of gravity, these five terms, and uh, all experimental tests of weak field gravity are consistent with those being exactly correct. Now, my new hypothesis for what gravity is about is that it's kind of this twin of special relativity, whereas in special relativity, in both cases you square it, but in special relativity, if two observers agree about that first term, in other words, if they're an equivalence class based on that first term being the same, that is what special relativity is about. And my proposal for gravity is if you square those things up and you the other three are the, exactly the same, uh, if that's an equivalence class for you, then that means you're dealing with um, with gravity. That an observer is simply, one observer is just simply uh, so much farther away from a gravitational source. So if you do that with these little series, uh, you come up with the idea of um, that the difference quaternion is going to be different by these square root kind of uh, factors, that when you square it, you get the exactly the same kind of uh, series sort of thing. But you actually have an extra term here that you don't normally have. Now this do does occur in, in general relativity, but as far as I can tell, when people do cosmology, they don't actually take into account uh, this first order correction on the radial term. And uh, that really deserves uh, uh, more serious consideration, I think. All right, so if I go and, and be consistent with every experimental test, I add on these extra terms. I think what I get out of there, this is a solution consistent with weak field tests, but that's not going to be consistent with uh, being a solution to the Einstein field equations. So it is genuinely a new proposal for how gravity works. And it's a bit of speculation based on these six terms that I get there, but um, I, I find the idea that maybe it has to do with uh, exponential functions because exponential functions are um, work um, on in so many different um, fundamental equations. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to maybe say, well, you got six terms, why don't I just give you all the rest? Uh, <laughs> but we'll have to uh, wait and see on that. Um, to see if that works out. So now I wanted to check it out numerically, and so I put in the the um, Earth's uh, weight and our radius and speed of light, and I cranked this all through. And you know, observer C is all of 10 centimeters away. Um, so um, I get to figure out what the difference is, and um, all the digits are the same for this versus that. And uh, that means that uh, there's no need to square this up. It's going to be the same. And that's kind of our experience with gravity. It really doesn't make a difference. Um, so I looked at something more extreme. I said, what if it was just zero? In other words, this the is C wasn't just 10 centimeters away, but say a light year away. Um, <laughs> then then um, the numbers finally get a little bit different. And if you square it all up, uh, you'll see that the time this is time-like, which means that it's uh, it is not time-like exact. So that's different. But all three of these guys are exact, and so that means in my proposal that um, they're at just different heights in a gravity field. Okay, so uh, that was just a quick introduction into this notebook. Feel free to download it. Uh, feel free to think about it. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much.